Thanks everyone, a really warm welcome to you all. Um, today on the floor, Simon Cree from the <coughs> Central Management team is going to help us out with microphones for questions. And Professor McCrimmon is here to chair as well as myself. So my name's Anna and I'm the Diabetes Network Manager. So we have four fantastic um, speakers today and we're going to cover a range of different subject areas. <coughs> Uh, so hopefully all our speakers are, are here. Yeah, they are. They are? They are. <laughs> okay. That's great. Hi, Mary. Um, so Morag's a, a, a senior clinical trials manager, and she's going to talk about a cardio protection um, sort of trial where Essentially, they're trying to see if a chemotherapy that's very toxic could be, um, the, an intervention could be put in place to prevent that. Uh, Mark's going to talk about a mesothelioma international trial platform, looking at asbestos-derived um, mesothelioma and explaining to us how that might develop and what can be done about it. Uh, Filippo's uh, representing the memo team, so he's going to speak about a fantastic remote trial called Time, which was published recently, and will tell us when is the best point of the day to take antihypertensive medicines. And finally, Professor Ralston, Stuart Ralston, will speak about um, genetically identifying people who are at risk of Paget's bone disease and then delivering an intervention to those people before their illness develops. Um, so another fantastic example of a genetic stratification. I have absolutely nothing to say at all. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing the talks. Yeah, we rather hope we might press on and then get, get you away in time for lunch. So without further ado, um, Morag, do you want to step up? It's a friendly crowd, so don't yes. worry. Um, there's your buzzer and your microphone's there. Okay. And you're being recorded, so just smile. Watch what I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Anna, and thank you all for coming. I'm pleased today to present the Cardiac Care Trial. There we go. Um, on behalf of the Chief Investigator, Dr. Peter Henriksen. So I'll start with a little bit of background um, to the study and rationale. <clears throat> so anthracyclines are used successfully in the treatment of breast cancer and lymphoma. Um, they, in addition, but in addition to killing cancer cells, um, they um, can also cause cardiomyocyte injury and death. And this is associated with changes in the left ventricular um, function and future heart failure risk. Um, anthracycline myocardial injury is associated with increased um, circulating cardiac troponin concentrations. And these current guidelines that came out just before our trial um, advocate the use of troponin monitoring to identify patients at risk of cardiotoxicity and heart failure. The guidelines also indicate the use of cardioprotective treatments, angiotensin blockers and beta blockers to be considered to prevent cardiotoxicity in at-risk patients. <clears throat> so it's clear that cardiotoxicity um, associated um, with current anthracycline regimes is lower than it was 20-odd um, years ago. And this reflects a move to lower dose regimes and more careful patient selection. And there's a meta-analysis that suggested a mean ejection fraction fall of 5.4% um, um, is seen about six months after completion of chemotherapy. So given this reduction in cardiotoxicity, um, clinical trials of cardioprotective therapy that's going to include or randomize all patients, you do face then the challenge of dilution of treatment effect as only a minority of patients are going to go on and develop um, clinically important cardiotoxicity. So a conclusion from Professor Omland, who was actually on our TSC, um, 
who was um, running the PRADA study, which was investigating cardiotoxicity in breast cancer patients, is that we should be focusing future trials and interventions on patients at highest risk of cardiotoxicity. So before we started the cardiac care pr uh, trial, we did a, a pilot, so we, did, we gathered some pilot data in breast cancer patients. And we demonstrated a dose-dependent increase in troponin concentrations using a high-sensitivity troponin assay. We saw every breast cancer patient in this uh, pilot had um, exhibited an increase in their troponin concentrations following each dose of epirubicin. The, the concentration of troponin never fell. It only ever went up between cycles. And you can see that we had some patients had a, a much more marked increase in their troponin by the end of their chemotherapy compared to others. Um, and so we could see that using a, this high sensitivity troponin assay was a, a way of getting patient specific measure for anthracycline related uh, myocardial injury. And previous work demonstrated that elevated um, troponin concentrations during and after anthracycline uh, treatment predict the development of left ventricular dysfunction. So moving on to the objectives of our trial, they were to determine <clears throat> whether treatment, uh, whether on treatment troponin monitoring identifies patients at risk of developing anthracycline cardiotoxicity and to understand whether patients with um, high risk troponin concentrations are protected from anthracycline cardiotoxicity with combined candesartan and curvedilol treatments. So using our pilot data um, from the breast cancer patients, we identified high-risk troponin uh, con concentration thresholds that could be used to predict the final troponin concentration in the upper tertile at the end of their chemotherapy. And you can see the, the, the levels there. <clears throat> it was a key assumption of the study that all clinically significant cardiotoxicity would be contained within this upper tertile high-risk group. Uh, so I'm just going to mix it and move on to the, the study flow. Um, and this is from the protocol. So patients were approached at clinic and if they consented to join the study, they had a cardiac MRI and a baseline screening visit before they started their chemotherapy, their anthracycline containing chemotherapy. As part of routine pre-chemo bloods, we added on this high sensitivity troponin assay to the, these routine bloods that were taken uh, before each anthracycline treatment cycle. Um, so they had their baseline MRI and then they went on to have their chemo and then, as we were measuring the troponin, if they had five nanograms or above before cycle two, so even after just one dose of epirubicin, or if they went above 23 in any of the subsequent cycles, these patients would at that point then be randomised. And they were randomised one to one to either um, the cardioprotective treatment, candesartan and curvedilol, or to standard care. Um, and that was our high risk arm. Um, the, re the patients who never went above those troponin thresholds were considered our low-risk arm and they remained unrandomised and they remained on the study. Um, all the patients um, would have their troponin measured throughout their treatment and up to six months after. Some patients would have had radiotherapy following their anthracycline um, and then all patients, the non-randomised and the, <coughs> the randomised, they all had a cardiac MRI um, six months after their last dose of, anth of anthracycline. So here's our consort diagram from the study. Um, you can see we enrolled um, about 45% of patients that we approached for the study, which was really good considering we were approaching patients just as they've been given a cancer diagnosis and a treatment plan. Um, I'm pleased to say that Despite the pandemic, we managed to hit and, and actually exceed our recruitment target and our randomization target. Um, <clears throat> our data completeness was pretty good. Um, in the randomized arm, you can see that we got nearly all um, patients reached their final endpoint measurement of the cardiac MRI. So moving on to the cardiac care trial results, which were published last month in circulation. 
So this is our baseline characteristics um, of all the trial patients. The age, sex, proportion of lymphoma patients, uh, planned epirubicin, epirubicin dose. Um, you can see it's very similar in the two randomised arms. Um, the proportion of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and the mean epirubicin dose are higher in the high-risk groups compared to the low-risk non-randomised group. Um, comorbidities like hypertension and type 2 diabetes were quite uncommon in our population. And the median baseline um, troponin right at the bottom there, um, you can see is higher in the high-risk group, high-risk randomised group compared to the low-risk group, as you'd expect. So this is a plot of the average troponin uh, concentration in the high-risk standard care group and the low-risk non-randomised group over time during their anthracycline, troponin, um, anthracycline chemotherapy treatment and up to six months after. Um, just to say, depending on if they were getting three, four or six cycles of chemotherapy, they would have anthracycline treatment from anywhere between 42 and 105 days. So that's the differences. Um, and as you can see, our protocol was successful in separating groups out by uh, treatment tr on treatment troponin concentrations. So our primary endpoint was change in left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, there was a slight reduction in both <coughs> arms, but there was no difference in the mean left ventricular ejection fraction change between treatment groups six months after completion of chemotherapy. An adjustment for this was uh, performed according to the pro prognostic factor shown there. Um, <clears throat> this slide illustrate, illustrates the absolute fall in left ventricular ejection fraction for the non-randomised and randomised groups. And there's a mean 2.9% fall in LVEF in the low-risk non-randomised group. And given that our secondary, uh, main secondary um, objective was to demonstrate that there was zero change in ejection fraction in the low-risk non-randomised group. The secondary objective was therefore not met. So um, a secondary measure of myocardial um, injury was troponin concentration between the baseline and two months, post, um, when the, two months after they'd finished their anthracycline chemotherapy. And this slide shows that there was no difference between randomised treatment groups both had similar increases in troponin two months after um, they'd finished their chemo. Nope. There we go. Um, so um, we did want to um, report on clinical cardiotoxicity outcomes. <clears throat> we did see persistent um, chiomar chiomar well, myocardial injury as measured by troponin um, two months after chemotherapy across all the groups, but we didn't see much clinically significant cardiotoxicity, which is good, I suppose, the toxicity is low. Um, so to conclude from this trial, um, the anthracycline um, chemotherapy was associated with a small reduction in ejection fraction across all three groups six months after their final treatment dose in breast cancer and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients. Um, neurohormal blockade with combined candesartan and carvedilol did not protect against ejection fraction, um, left ventricular ejection fraction fall or myocardial injury in patients that had high troponin concentrations during their chemotherapy. And patients with protocol-defined low-risk troponin concentrations developed a small but detectable drop in ejection fraction at six months. <clears throat> can also conclude that the cardiac care trial findings do not support the international guidelines, cardiontology guidelines, that recommend the use of troponin monitoring to, for surveillance of anthracycline cardiotoxicity or the use of cardioprotective therapy with neurohormal blockade to prevent cardiotoxicity. Of, of course, our findings are limited um, because they not, may not be applicable to certain vulnerable patient groups. And the future research should focus on how, when and if subclinical changes in myocardial function translate into clinical heart failure following treatment with anthracycline regimes used in current clinical practice. We only saw a small change in individuals after six months 
and we need to better understand long term um, the risk of heart failure at a population level. So I just finished by thanking all the investigators and the sites that took um, part in the study, as well as our funders and our sponsor. And here's the link to the publication in case anyone's interested. Thank you. Now we have time for some questions, and I've got one immediately. And we have to use a microphone. I think this is for the recording, right? Hi. Thanks, Morai. Hi. Um, you, you showed that some patients had radiotherapy and that there was a balance across your two randomised mm. groups. Did you look at who had left-sided and who had right-sided radiotherapy? Yeah, that was something we collected. So we collected um, whether they had it on their left or right breast, um, and that was included in the analysis. And as far as I'm aware, there was we couldn't see anything with that. Rod Taylor from Glasgow. So my area is half PEF, and, and I've got to say I'm, I'm just bowled over at your baseline ejection fractions, and I missed the start, but I mean, how much do you think your, your lack of demonstrating treatment effect was just due to the fact that, I mean, these people with LBFs weren't that bad? Yeah, that's true. I mean, our patient population was an average. We didn't have many vulnerable patient um, <coughs> groups. We excluded people already who had uncontrolled hypertension and were on ACE inhibitors. And so there's obviously other patients out there getting this treatment that weren't included in the trial, and it's possible that they are of higher risk. Yeah. yeah. And if I may, so, I mean, you were quite bold about saying that ECS guidelines shouldn't. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so given what you've just said, <clears throat> in, the con in the context of the patients that you recruited in the trial, that would be true, but it may be that we've excluded women who may potentially benefit from the treatment. Yes. Possibly, yes. I mean, for the the average population, I suppose you could say the ones that are not so vulnerable, maybe these guidelines are a little bit over-prescriptive. Um, you know, you're potentially worrying women by telling them they have an elevated troponin that doesn't actually mean anything clinically and potentially thinking they might need to take curvedilol and, be, you know, beta blockers and things, so... But yes, it did cause some controversy at the European meeting in Barcelona last year. <laughs> Hello, hi, I'm Filippo. Um, I'm a cardiologist. Uh, I'm from Dundee. Nice okay. presentation. Uh, just to say that when I was working in a hospital in Italy years ago, I saw patients treated with antracycline that developed heart failure years after the treatment. Yes. Okay, so I think the follow up, the six months follow up, probably is not, is too short. Yes. Uh, have you planned to do a long follow-up of this patient? Well, we haven't on this study uh, because that's the end of our trial. But um, some of Peter's, uh, Dr. Henriksen's colleagues, they are um, looking, trying to bring some of the women back in for longer-term follow-up of more cardiac MRIs down the line just to see what happens with them. The reason we chose six months was actually based on an Italian researcher <laughs> um, who'd um, showed that six months was kind of like the, the nadir of when they expected to see um, the difference. The other thing is, uh, I have seen that GLS, so the global longitudinal strain, was an important marker. So have you compared the prediction of GLS uh, with the troponin to see who is the so, predictor? So we actually um, did quite a lot of um, measurements from the MRI. They did um, volumes and strain measurements and GLS and a, a whole load of stuff. And I have to hold my hand up and say I'm not a cardiologist, so I, I don't really know much about all that. But there's certainly there's certainly been a lot of um, like the cardiology team have been looking at that quite a lot. I'm sure they can tell you more. <laughs> right, fantastic. I think now we need to move on to the next one. Thanks, okay. Laurie. Thank you very right. much. I'm going to pop this down here, and then Mark. Thank you very much. Just going to have to. You, oh, you set up. A yeah. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Uh, so yeah, so my name's Mark. Um, I'm a clinical research fellow based here at the Queen Elizabeth, working with the Glasgow Pleural Disease Unit. And I'm undertaking a PhD with the University of Glasgow at the moment under the supervision of Kevin Blythe and Andrew Jameson. Um, so a, a core part of my PhD will be the coordination and delivery of a clinical trial called Meso Origins, which I'm delighted to talk to you about today. 
Um, so I know we'll have a, a mixed audience in general, so um, I'll briefly outline plural mesothelioma and some of its challenges. We'll then talk about the Predict Measles International Accelerator Network and its overall ambitions. We'll look at meso origins and how <coughs> meso origins fits into the big picture. And we'll finish off by looking forward to some of um, the sort of future work plan with output from meso origins itself. Um, so I'm sure most of us will know that mesothelioma is a, a cancer that affects the lining of the lung. Um, it's an aggressive and curable cancer. Um, and despite recent advances with combination immunotherapy, the, the overall survival is, is poor. Um, it's a challenging diagnosis, <coughs> relying on good quality tissue biopsies. Um, and one of the ways in which we can quantify the challenges of mesothelioma is if we look at the volume of tumour at the time of diagnosis. So this was a study that was performed in Glasgow um, looking at the T stage and the median MRI volume um, correlation in patients diagnosed with mesothelioma. So as you can see, there's no real difference between stages T1 and T4. However, if we compare early stage mesothelioma, stage T1, with that of early stage lung cancer, for example, we can see a marked discrepancy of a hundredfold increase for patients with mesothelioma. Now, there's a lot that we can say here, but what I want us to take home is that patients with early stage mesothelioma T1 disease have a significant tumour burden. So that then gives us a rationale for, in, for inter, earlier intervention, potentially a pre-malignant time point. And this aligns very well with recent paradigm shifts seen within Cancer Research UK, outlined in, uh, outlined in their roadmap to the future in response to studies such as Tracer X. And when we consider pre-malignant disease in mesothelioma, there's a few unique characteristics it possesses. We know that it's a cancer associated with asbestos exposure in the vast majority of cases. And there's an unusual latency period of about 40 years between exposure and disease manifestation. And in clinical practice, what we see is a sub-cohort of patients who actually present at a benign time point with something we call asbestos-associated pleural inflammation, or otherwise known as non-specific pleuritis, or BAPE, you may have heard it in, in clinical practice. And in the UK, we know that approximately 10 to 15% of patients who present at this benign time point will go on to develop mesothelioma. So what this gives us is a, is a unique window of opportunity in which we can prospectively follow up patients from a benign time point through their evolution to mesothelioma. And if we can exploit this opportunity, it may allow us to unlock that final biological milestone that's driving the disease. And this theory, this concept, is based off lots of literature and preclinical models. Um, for example, there's a study by Chernova, uh, shown here, which shows that hypermethylation of CDK N2A will precede the loss of tumor suppressor genes in mesothelioma in mouse models. So if we can replicate similar results in a human cohort, there's exciting opportunities then for novel targeted therapies and also early intervention um, and early detection. And this is really <coughs> where the Predict Meso International Accelerator Network comes in. Um, you see, it's a, it's a big, ambitious network consisting of over 100 investigators spanning 13 countries. And the key scientific questions are, how does asbestos-driven chronic inflammation evolve into mesothelioma? And what are the key molecular events and the associated vulnerabilities? As I mentioned, it's an ambitious project with lots of moving parts, which can largely be distilled down into five work packages as seen here. And this is out with the scope of today's talk. But we'll be focusing today on work package one, which is where meso origins comes in. And work package one is really all about um, creating the raw materials and the collaborations required for downstream analysis. So what is meso-origins? Well, meso-origins is a prospective multicenter observational study, and first and foremost, it's a tissue banking study. So the primary objective of meso-origins is the generation of a large tissue resource comprising prospectively collected longitudinal tissue pairs from patients with benign pleural disease who go on to develop mesothelioma. Uh, secondary objectives include the generation of a multi-omic risk prediction model for use in patients with benign pleural disease, and this will be done via collection of serum proteomics, exhaled breath metabolomics, and perfusion MRI. We'll also look to better characterise intrapatient tumour heterogeneity, which is well documented in mesothelioma, and we'll do this via multi-region thoracoscopic biopsies. Um, so to achieve all these objectives, mesoorigins has two arms, A and B, and we'll discuss each of these in turn shortly. Um, Briefly, Meso Origins was based off a mixed method multicenter feasibility study, the results of which were published in the last couple of months. Um, and this was crucial for uh, both looking at our sample size and our eligibility criteria, and it's worth a read if you're interested. 
So Miser Origins commenced recruitment in June 2022 and will be recruiting provisionally until August 2025. Which is say we're a multi-centre study, currently open to 20 centres spanning 15 UK sites with a further 10 sites in various stages of setup. So if we look at study design now, so as I mentioned, there's two arms, arm A and B. Arm A is, is the main arm of the study where we'll achieve our primary objective. So to do this, we'll look to recruit patients with benign pleural disease as defined by this eligibility criteria here. So based off any form of pleural biopsy within the last 12 months uh, and a history or imaging compatible with asbestos exposure. This is a study diagram. It's a bit of a messy slide, but I'll just distill some key points. So once patients are uh, eligible, patients are consented and recruited. Um, the key study activity will be the retrieval of their benign biopsy, which makes them eligible for the study. This biopsy will then be retrieved and sent up to the biorepository here in Glasgow for storage. At this initial visit, we'll also use the opportunity to take our risk profiling inputs in the form of blood, exhale breath, an invitation to join the MRI substudy. Patients will then simply undergo six monthly surveillance for a total of two years, and this is really in line with clinical practice for patients, uh, for surveillance of these patients. Um, and if there's clinical concerns of mesothelioma evolution at any time point, then a repeat biopsy will happen at the discretion of uh, the parent team. And based off the feasibility study, if we recruit 500 patients, which is our endpoint, we anticipate about 14% will go on to develop mesothelioma, and therefore we'll generate 63 matched benign malignant tissue pairs. Also within RMA, patients who undergo 18 months of follow-up with no clinical concerns of disease evolution will be invited back for a research-specific biopsy, either in the form of a local anaesthetic thoracoscopy or an image-guided biopsy. And the purpose of this will be to generate benign-benign or benign no mesothelioma evolution pairs for comparative analysis. So how are we doing so far? Well, um, we're aiming to recruit 500 patients. So far, we've recruited 77 across the study. So you can see from the recruitment plot, we're perhaps behind, uh, a little bit behind schedule from where we'd expect to be. And this is largely due to the fact we're not currently up to speed with our number of recruiting centres. And we will need our total 25 sites up and running to achieve our, our end point. And our second wave of recruitment focused on uh, mesothelioma endemic areas, including the northeast of England and the south coast, as you can see on our map. In terms of the primary endpoint, um, within our RMA cohort, we've had 12 mesothelioma evolutions, of which 10 have been confirmed histologically. So we, we've generated 10 of our benign meso tissue pairs so far, which gives us an evolution rate of 14.1%, which is in line with the feasibility study. Um, interestingly, our, we have a mean of three months between our benign and our meso biopsies so far. So that's our main in a nutshell. Arm B um, is where we'll look to address and um, better detail intrapatient tumour heterogeneity. So Arm B essentially functions as a different study. We have a different eligibility criteria. We'll be looking to recruit patients with suspected mesothelioma, which we define as um, either a unilateral pleural effusion or a pleural-based mass lesion and also a history of asbestos exposure. And these will be patients who are planned to undergo a thoracoscopy, either a local anaesthetic thoracoscopy or a surgical biopsy. And the bulk of the study activity in RMB will happen at their time of thoracoscopy. So once the primary operator is satisfied that there's enough clinical tissue, uh, they'll then look to retrieve um, ideally four to six multi-region biopsies from four to six different zones across the pleura as depicted by the maps on the bottom right. So RMB progress so far. So you can see RMB recruitment is, is going very well. Um, we aim to recruit 120 patients across our sites, which we estimate will generate 42 mesothelioma diagnosis. So, so far we've, we've recruited 85 patients, of which 34 have been diagnosed with mesothelioma. And in terms of our multi-region biopsies, we're getting good numbers as well. So we've averaged 4.4 um, per case, which is the same if you just look at, uh, isolate that just by patients diagnosed with mesothelioma. Uh, now, uh, importantly, um, of our RMB participants who have subsequently had a benign diagnosis, 21 have gone on to uh, transition into RMA as well. And this is a very re fruitful recruitment pathway for us because it will permit linkage of multi-region pre-malignant biopsies with any subsequent evolution cases. So we're generating this prospect, this wealthy prospective tissue resource within meso origins, and what do we aim to do with it? Well, initially, we'll look to perform multiomic molecular characterization in a suite of downstream predict meso work packages. 
So via a number of collaborators, we have access to infrastructure in which we can interrogate the genome, the epigenome, the transcriptome, and the immunome of both our benign and our malignant samples. And can we ultimately perform, um, combine this information to perform a pathway interrogation to see what the drivers are behind mesothelioma evolution? We then look to plug, in downstream packages, look to plug this information into new preclinical models. And the overall ambition is to generate novel targeted therapies, which may take a variety of forms. So in conclusion, we've seen that patients with early stage mesothelioma have in fact a large volume disease. And this gives us a rationale for focusing energy on an earlier time point, a pre-malignant time point. We've seen that um, clinical presentation at a benign time point provides a unique window of opportunity for us to study the biology driving evolution of mesothelioma. The Predict Meso International Accelerator Network is focused on this goal, and within this, Meso Origins is currently collecting a unique uh, prospectively collected tissue resource um, for downstream analysis. Um, Meso Origins is a very collaborative study. As you can see, we've got, um, this is just a, a couple of people to thank. There's lots more involved, so um, thank you to all those people. Um, we have a website if anyone's interested in hearing more. If not, I'm happy to field some questions just now. Thanks, Mark. Wow, Good. that's a lot of people to go. Yes, I know, I know. How do you manage to do that? Um, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess that's probably the, the key challenge is, is coordinating. Uh, hopefully, we'll be up to 25 sites. Um, we're fortunate to work with lots of good people in these sites, and we have an excellent project manager, Alex McPherson, who uh, is very helpful with that regards as well. But that's certainly the key challenge of, of this study. Questions from the floor? Thanks, that was very interesting. Okay. Sure, I'll stay in, um, You mentioned about like picking up your target population, and some of them are serendipitous. You know, they have a chest X-ray, and you see a plaque. And the other ones, occupational exposure. I mean, do people know they've been exposed, or you know, or do you target specific occupations? I'm just interested where they come from. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, eligibility criteria in terms of asbestos exposure, it's either imaging compatible, so as you say, pleural plaques, or a history of, and the history of it can be nuanced. So we do leave that, I guess, at the discretion of the, the recruiting team. It just requires a, a very good history. Um, and say a lot, lots of patients aren't necessarily aware that they have been exposed, but if they have a, for example, a very high risk occupation, then we might we might consider them, but that's a case by case basis. Any other questions? Yeah, very quickly, Mark. It looks like your recruitment in, in your B sub-study was far better and far quicker than sub-study A. What was the difference between the two? Were they done with the different times or were they about set up? Um, no, the, so the setup was the same. I think it's just the eligibility criteria. So um, RMB is recruiting patients with suspected mesothelioma, of which we just seem to have a, a wealth of, of of patients being recruited for that. In addition to that, our target numbers are are lower. Um, for RMA, we're looking to recruit uh, patients with benign pleural disease. And within the eligibility criteria, there are a couple of other limitations, including um, they, they can't have received previous talc pleurodesis, for example. So um, a number of our sites have been struggling to find these patients. Um, our second wave of site invitations have focused on areas um, such as northeast of England, where our current sites are recruiting very well. Um, so the vast majority of our patients so far have come from Glasgow in the northeast of England, which would fit with sort of patterns we see in terms of mesothelioma presentations. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I wonder if we're setting ourselves up to fail. You're not going to get in your sites in order to recruit at a different time point. So should we be modifying our approach and intervention in a way that you know our funder is not looking at oh what's going wrong, or what the team are doing? Is there? Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think our numbers are based off a feasibility study, which was based off four centres. So I think there's been some natural challenges with upscaling that to, to 25 sites. Um, what we within our eligibility criteria, we're recruiting primarily. We're, we're recruiting both incident and prevalent cases, in that we recruit patients who have had a biopsy within the last 12 months. So when our new sites are up and running, what we we expect to have is a bit of a front loading of RMA recruitment as they as they capture all the patients currently within their clinics. So as these new sites come on board in the next couple of months, we're hoping for a wee sharp rise, but we'll uh, we'll see what happens.
speed of setup is so critical, isn't it? It is, yeah. It takes um, it's one lesson has been these things uh, always take longer than anticipated. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So on to our third speaker. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. I'm, uh, I, it's a great pleasure to be here uh, today to present the result of the treatment in the morning versus evening or time study. I'm Dr. Filippo Pigazzani. I'm a clinical research fellow at the University of Dundee, and today I'm here presenting on behalf of Professor Thomas McDonough, chief investigator of the time study, and on behalf of my colleague from that in Dundee work on the study. The time study was funded by a grant from the British Heart Foundation and as I said Professor Thomas McDonough was the chief investigator. Just start with a little bit of background. Um, probably almost of you knows that blood pressure as other physiological function in our body follows a circadian rhythm, just a 24 hour rhythm. And we have usually high values of blood pressure during the day when we are awake and we are active, and we have lower blood pressure value during the night, in particular where during our sleep time. <coughs> it's quite important to maintain this rhythm because when we lose this rhythm, and in particular when we lose the capacity to, to decline, to decrease our blood pressure during the night, this increases our risk of having cardiovascular events. This has led some research to the hypothesis that if we take medication for blood pressure at bad time, this could help to restore the, norm the normal circadian rhythm of blood pressure and can help to reduce the risk of cardiovascular event. Previously, um, in 2010, the MAPIC study was conducted in Spain. And this researcher found that in participants that were taking blood pressure medication at that time, there was a substantial reduction in major cardiovascular event compared with those who were taking medication in the morning. However, this study was not prospectively powered. There was no report about the process of randomization, and the endpoints were not adjudicated. So there was a clear need for a new study, a new large prospective randomized study that could confirm or refute the finding of the MAPIC study. And this is the time study. The time study was designed with the aim to investigate whether even indulging of usually antipotensive medication could improve the major cardiovascular outcomes compared with morning dosing in patients with higher blood pressure. The time study was a prospective, randomized, open-label, blinded endpoint study, but the novelty of time was that time was a remote trial, and this was 2011, okay? So keep in mind this, it was quite innovative for that time. It means that no requirement for in-person study visit. Participant could be recruited through a online study portal that was used to screen, consent, and randomize, and follow up patients. In this slide, you can see the structure of the study and the flow. You see that after the study entry, people, participants were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to take their usually prescribed blood pressure medication in the morning or in the evening. And the dosing time instruction were sent by email. <coughs> after randomization, participants were follow up for one month and then after three months uh, at the end of the study. And we collected, we look at, we use record linkage uh, to NHS national database to collect event of interest. These are the eligibility criteria of time. So time recruited, adults with hypertension, <coughs> aged 18 or over, that we have taken at least one med medication for hypertension so just once daily. <coughs> and excluded people with, uh, uh, that were doing <coughs> night shift work or were taking antipotensive medication twice daily. The outcome of the time study, so the primary outcome was a composite of hospitalization for non-fatal myocardial infarction, 
non fatal stroke or vascular death. Secondary outcome, each component of the primary outcome plus all cause mortality and hospitalization or death from congestive heart failure. Among the secondary outcome, we also had self-reported adherence to allocated dose in time and uh, um, pre-specified patient report adverse events. In terms of statistics, the main analysis of time was an intention to treat analysis. And time requires 631 participants with an adjudicated first primary endpoint to detect 20% superiority or evening dosing compared to morning dosing with 80% power. We carried out also a safety analysis. Here are the results. 21,104 people with hypertension all over the UK were recruited in time between December 2011 and June 2018. The median follow-up was 5.2 years, with a maximum follow-up of 9.3 years. There was a good retention. Just 5% of participants in the evening dosing group and 3% of participants in the morning dosing group withdrew from the study. And at the end, we achieved our target of 731 endpoint because time ended with 752 participants with an adjudicated primary endpoint. In this slide, you can see the baseline demographic, and I want you to concentrate on the mean age was 65, but what is important is the range of the age, 19 and 95. There was a good proportion of male and female and uh, if you see that there was a slow rate of smoking, 4%, but it was, there was a small percentage of participants reporting diabetes and previous cardiovascular disease, so quite a healthy population. And if you see on, on the right, there was a good distribution. A well the, the baseline characteristics were well balanced. Okay, here are the primary results. There was no difference in terms of primary outcome of hospitalization for non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or vascular death between the morning dosing and the evening dosing group. When we look at the pre-specified pre subgroup analysis, we found the same results, no different. And for secondary outcome, cardiovascular, cardiovascular secondary outcome and mortality, we found no significant difference between morning dosing and evening dosing group. We look at the adherence as a secondary outcome. As you can see, at any time during the time study, people in the morning dosing group were more adherent than people allocated to the evening dosing group. And this is also at the end of the study, sorry, you can see here. When we look at the pre-specified adverse events, we found that in the evening dosing group there were less falls that in the morning dosing group. And in terms of fracture, hospitalization for fracture or, or not, and hospitalization for glaucoma, there was no significant difference between the two groups. So in conclusion, what time found? Found that the evening dosing of usually antipertensive medication did not improve the primary outcome of hospitalization for non-fatal MI, non-fatal <coughs> stroke, and vascular death compared to morning dosing in a general population in the UK with high blood pressure. We remember that. There was, taking medication in the evening was quite safe. Someone, you know, we have people that are still worried about prescribing medication for hypertension in the evening because obviously they worry about falls and fracture, there was no difference. So taking medication in the evening is not harmful. There was a better adherence in the morning. This is why the recent guideline of hypertension published recently suggests to prescribe medication in the morning because on the basis of the finding of the time study. Further analysis of time of of time are ongoing. There are four sub-studies, and one of them has been just completed and ready for submission, so stay tuned, because interesting results are coming. Also, we are waiting for new results from the Canadian BetMed, the BetMed Fair. There are studies that have the same design of the time study, 
So hopefully they will find the same result of time, otherwise we will be in trouble. And uh, for now, I would say for now, patient can be advised to take their antihypertensive medication at the time that is more convenient for them. Time was published last year on the Lancet, so this QR code will take you to the main publication. And uh, I would like to thank you all the people involved in this big trial, in particular the time study participants, the PPI group, the British Health Foundation and the British and Irish Hypertension Society, all the colleagues that make this possible. This was a big trial and I think we will see new data coming. Very interesting. So I would like to finish with this phrase. The time for action is now. It's never too late to do something. I would, I would like to say because we are in the NHS, it's never too late to do something good for our patient. Thank you. So many patients recruited, and it's great to see that older age group included as well. There's a question back here. Uh, uh, Rich Weller, Edinburgh. I'm, I'm a dermatologist. Did you, did you look at time of year? Because um, sunlight lowers blood pressure. There's a big seasonal effect in blood pressure. Six millimeters systolic lower in summer than winter in Britain. Spain is sunnier than Britain. I don't know. I just wonder if that might be a confounder to look at. Okay, so I will answer this question telling you that I, I've designed the chronotype substudy of time. So, and uh, we look at the chronotype of people. And uh, so we are coming out with, uh, hopefully, with the result quite soon. Yeah, but this is, uh, is true. So there is a seasonality in blood pressure, and not just in blood pressure, even in the cardiovascular event. So we have a chrono risk, someone called that, so we have a peak of cardiovascular event in the morning and the latter peak in the late afternoon. And, but also we have a peak during the week and we have a peak during different season. And uh, I know that, for example, the, the bad weather <laughs> has an implication on that. So there is an increasing market of inflammation. It's more related to probably to the light and uh, this, is, this is one of my hypotheses. I come from Italy, and I have to say that people that live in, in, in sunny, even if they say that Dundee is a sunny city, well. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the sun is really important, I think, and the light is, a, is a really fun. This, is, this Mediterranean area is just food, but I think it's the light at the end that helps us to live a good life. to ask a question yeah. Yeah, thanks um, thank you the recovery trial had a very easy time obtaining routinely collected data for follow-up and obviously they were following people up to death you were looking for major adverse cardiovascular events um, do you have any experience that could be usefully shared with other trials that are going to use routinely collected data healthcare systems data for follow-up across the UK uh, from time because if you're doing an event driven trial given the lag time to completeness of data the differences between data sets across the d nations of the UK it does generate quite big technical yeah. problems for large trials any any nuggets you can share with us so I know I don't know if I have understood the question <laughs> <laughs> but I think, sorry yeah I think time was using SAE to yeah. So what, no, 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 how we adjudicate the endpoint in time is that we use self-reported adverse event. So participants reported to, to get, you know, to have a, a hospitalization, an hospital admission, and then we use record linked data just to match with what the patient was telling us. And then we had administrator calling GP hospital to get the record, and then we prepare packages and we send the packages for adjudication to the endpoint committee. Thank you. Uh, David Hamilton, Glasgow Caledonian. Um, just, just a point of interest, actually. Um, so remote trial, 
uh, you hinted at um, acceptability or adherence, but how did you measure your intervention fidelity in terms of if they were taking it in the morning or the evening in, you know, in, in this setup? So, uh, the participant received every three months an email that invited them to go to the portal and to, uh, to answer a questionnaire. So, there was a questionnaire uh, that was sending, uh, we were sending out every three months this questionnaire. During the conduct of the trial, the, the same group from Spain in 2019, they published the IGA chronotherapy study. And this was quite a, a challenge for time because the IGA study uh, recruited 19,000 <coughs> participants and they found the same finding of the MAPEC. So it was better to take medication in the evening compared to morning. So we discovered that most of the people, because of this was, there was a, the media was covering this big result. It was published on the uh, uh, you know, Heart, European Heart Journal. And most of our patients moved from morning to evening. And so we had to go back to the, our patient asking, are you still taking medication in the morning and the evening? And some of them <coughs> said, no, we are taking medication in the evening due to the fact that it's better. Because they, our uh, independent monitoring committees decided to go ahead with time, we tell to the patient that they could go back to the morning dosing or the allocated dosing time because the, the evidence were there. But I, I have to say that still now there is a very, I would say, hot debate about this. And in the hypertension community, these data are still not fully accepted. And uh, the time study has been, um, I would say, integrated in the new guidelines. And for now, <coughs> since we have published this, time is, you know, let's say the definitely answer. But in terms of the reasons, yes, we had some problem. And most of the people that tell us which kind of medication we're taking when they enter in the study, the 80% of them, they were taking medication in the morning. So this is why we think that there was a problem with the adherence in the evening dosing. But obviously, we need to, some, this is a pragmatic trial, okay? This is not a randomized study where you see a patient in the clinic and you, obviously, we need to accept some sort of balance when we do pragmatic trial, thing. Okay, thanks, Nico. Okay, thank you. Would you prefer to sit? No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I've got my bin boot. <laughs> um, so I click on this. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I'm Stuart Ralston, um, a rheumatologist from uh, Edinburgh. I've got an interest in bone disease, particularly Paget's disease. And I'm going to be presenting the results of the, of the ZIP study on behalf of my colleagues. So it's to do with this disease, Paget's disease of bone. Uh, the problem in Paget's disease is the remodeling and renew pr process in bone is just totally disrupted. So renewal or repair of bone just goes at a very accelerated rate and can lead to things like, as in this patient, quite significant bone deformity. And often it's picked up quite late, you know, by the time uh, complications have already developed. Importantly, it's a strong genetic component and the most important pathogenic gene or the most important gene that predisposes is um, sequestrosome 1. And complications are shown there, so it can be quite a morbid uh, condition. So what the ZIP trial was about is that, well, we know that Paget's disease often presents late with irreversible damage. And the aim of the study was to answer the question, can genetic testing for sequestrosome 1 mutations coupled with targeted intervention with zoledronic acid prevent the development and progression of Paget's? So it wasn't just a clinical trial, it was a program of genetic testing linked to a clinical trial. So it's kind of precision medicine as well. Um, it was, uh, um, whoops, I've gone past two slides. Yeah, it was a... Uh, yeah, it was a multi-centre and international trial. There were 27 sites in seven countries. It was a bit of a marathon. It started in March 2010. Um, COVID didn't help, but we eventually got it over the line in December 2021. Um, turning to the endpoints, um, 
Prime of the endpoint was a number of participants with new lesions consistent with Paget's disease on bone scan. The bone scan is very good at picking up lesions uh, thought to be Paget's. Secondary with a number of lesions and change in existing lesions. We also looked at biochemical markers of bone turnover, quality of life and complications related to Paget's. So here's the consort diagram. As I say, there was a genetic testing phase. We tested 750 unaffected relevant, uh, relatives of people with P Pagets. That was usually the sons or daughters of patients with Pagets. Um, 350 tested positive. We invited them to take part. 128 declined. 222 agreed, and they were randomised one-to-one to, one to get zoledronic acid, which is a potent bisphosphonate that turns off bone turnover, or an identical placebo. The median follow-up was 84 months. wasn't meant to be as long as that, but it was. And at the end of the day, 90 in each group completed. So it was an 80% completion group, which wasn't bad at all. In regard to technical methods, bone scans, radionuclide scans, were used to look at bone lesions. Bone turnover, we measured what's called plasma CTX, a bone resorption marker, P1NP, a formation marker. Health-related quality of life, we looked at SF36, the HAD score for anxiety and depression and pain uh, using the BPI score. On statistics, um, for bone lesions, Fisher's exact test or McNemer's test for bone lesions depending, McNemer's test was looking at before and after, and repeated measures, ANOVA, for changes in biochemical markers in QOL. So, what were the results? Well, first of all, the baseline characteristic was a slight predominance of women, um, 55%. Actually, Paget's is more common in men, but women, in my experience, are more likely to volunteer for clinical trials. Um, ages were matched, aged about 50. If I can just highlight that at the start of the trial, we thought we were going to start early before Paget's disease developed, but in fact, 8% of people in the zoledronic acid and 10% in the placebo had already got Paget's and bone scan, so we were slightly too late. Although I should say they were asymptomatic. Here's just an example of a couple of bone scans. So this is one participant at baseline, Pagets of T8, which you can see by the arrow, and another patient with Pagets of the left hemipelvis. So what were the results? Well, um, we had serendipitously, or at least by chance, there were more lesions at baseline in the placebo group than uh, the zoledronic acid group, um, although the proportion of patients with lesions was about the same. In the ZA group, 86.7% of lesions had disappeared by the end of study, compared with 3.4% in the placebo group. Um, new lesions at end of study, two in the placebo group versus zero in the zoledronic acid. That was not significant, but obviously it's fewer. Patients with static or worsened lesions, zero in the ZA group versus 8.8% in the placebo group. That was a secondary endpoint. That was statistically significant. And complications of Paget's disease, although the study wasn't powered to look at complications, in fact, one patient developed complications or one participant um, developed complications compared with none in the ZA group. So everything is going in favour of ZA, as you can see. And I thought I'd show this. It's quite interesting. This is the participant who developed complications. That is his baseline bone scan. Uh, you may not be a radiologist, but you see that big black area? That's Paget's disease in the cervical spine. The X-ray shows Paget's disease in the cervical spine. This caused some consternation, I can tell you, when we saw uh, the bone scan. The patient actually was minimally symptomatic, at all, hardly at all. He was playing five-a-side football. He had an MRI scan, didn't show any compromise and he was randomised, as it turns out, to placebo, although neither he nor the local investigator knew that. Turned out he started to develop neurosymptoms after one year, and he required rescue therapy with solidronic acid. Just showing one slide on the effect of lesions. So the purple bars are baseline, the green bars are end of study, and the placebo group on the right, 10% uh, had lesions at the start in placebo, 9.9% at the end. I should say that pa patient I've told you about who had rescue therapy declined to have an end of study bone scan, so the placebo group did it even worse than it looks in that scan and that slide. Whereas if we look at participants with lesions in the ZE group, 8.1% at baseline and 0.9% at the end of study. Okay, turning to biochemical markers of bone turnover. So as I mentioned, there's high bone turnover in Paget's disease. That's what causes the problem. And these two are markers of bone turnover. So this is CTX and that's P1NP. CTX is resorption, P1NP is permeation. What you're looking at is um, mean squared, uh, mean 
means adjusted for baseline uh, uh, characteristics. And placebo group, not much change. Zoledronic acid group, a significant reduction throughout the whole of the study, up to 84 months. So a very long duration of effect with this intervention. Uh, unbelievable, really, when you think about it. So in quality of life and depression, the scores for pain, depression, anxiety were low, indicating not much pain, not much depression, not much anxiety. And the average SF 36, 50, 36 scores were close to 50 at baseline. When we looked at how scores emerged, there was a slight change in favour of the ZA group, but none of those was significant. Moving quickly on to adverse events, these were very, very well balanced between the groups. 77% versus 78%, only 1.4% in the ZA group and 0.3% of um, events were thought to be related <coughs> to the treatment. Importantly, uh, we, we didn't have any osteonecrosis of the jaw or atypical femoral fractures in either group, and those are complications of uh, bisphosphonate treatment. So, um, strengths and weaknesses, well, it was a randomised double-blind trial. The Looking, the observers looking at the bone scans were blinded to treatment allocation and a, a quite an extended duration of follow-up. The weaknesses, we were surprised to see more people had Paget's at baseline than anticipated. The proportion who developed new lesions was small and it wasn't powered to look at complications, although as it turned out, one patient did develop complications. So what does this mean if you've got a family history of Paget's disease? Well, what the study clearly showed is that in this patient group who were targeted by genetic testing, zoledronic acid caused regression of existing lesions, reduced the proportion with new lesions, and also we had one patient that developed complications. Um, there was prolonged su pr suppression of biochemical markers of bone turnover. And based on this, we would hesitate to suggest that perhaps genetic testing with sequestrin 1 coupled with zoledronic acid, may be a treatment option for people with a family history of Paget's to prevent the disease progressing and, in fact, to reverse it, as I've shown, even if it has developed. So I'll just wind up by uh, listing the acknowledgements. First of all, the local investigators and collaborators, uh, too many to mention. The participants and family members who underwent genetic testing, support staff in all centres, staff of the ECTU uh, who were involved in the study and the funders as shown there. So I'll wind up there and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay. How, far, how well you did, you know, did it drift up again? Did you need further intervention or a higher Sh dose? Sure, yeah, I, I didn't show that actually because it's quite complicated with the reference ranges because they vary depending on if you're male, male or female, age above 50, age low 50, but those means were all within the normal range. So these people do not have high biomarkers, in fact. The biomarkers are in the normal range, but within that, the zoledronic acid, as you could see, was clearly suppressing them. Because one thing we did think about was, well, could we pick up these people by CTX and P1NP without doing a bone scan? The answer was no. The predicted positive, you know, the sensitivity and sens specificity was too low. So if you were going to do this, the theme would be sequestrum one, if positive, bone scan, and then offer treatment. The other, I guess the follow-up question is for those individuals with Pagets who don't have a genetic, an obvious genetic marker, are there ways of looking, there must be other markers out there. Sure. I mean, th there's, there's family history, there's age, and there's being male. Those are the only three <laughs> known predictors. We picked on sequestrum one because it's the most important gene, but we're doing another study now called GAP-DPD where there's, there's 14 genes involved in Paget's, we were profiling all of those 14 genes. So we're kind of repeating this without the CTIM, thank God. But that will be interesting to know if we can, if we can pick up those patients. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Hi, Stuart. Just uh, quickly want to ask, um, the bone turnover you could see started going up again after about seven years. So could you give those patients or um, people that are prone to Paget's, 
could you give them another <coughs> dose of ZA and how often could you do that without it being bad? Sure, I mean, I think that might be possible. I should say we're following up this cohort in what's called the ZIP LTE long-term extension and that's due to report in another couple of years' time. So it will be interesting to see what happens to those. But in osteoporosis, for example, Morag, we give ZA annually for three years and then give a break off for, for three years. So I think it could be you'd be looking at a treatment, maybe give a shot and then maybe six or seven years later another shot. And I think, you know, that obviously is going to be quite acceptable to patients. Very quick one, Stuart, um, about gender stereotypes and participation in clinical trials. In cardiovascular diseases, we notice exactly the opposite of what you found, which is that usually women are very uh, unrepresented mm. in clinical trials, and it leads to hypotheses about um, women being more likely to volunteer their husbands for participation <laughs> and vice versa, and all sorts of things like that. Did, did you tr have you tried to get any insight into why in Paget's participation amongst women is higher than men? We, we haven't looked at that. I can tell you that the proportion of patients with a sequestrosome one mutation was identical in men and women because it's in chromosome five, so that's no. And all I can say is we did our best. <laughs> you know, we sent them the information, but more more women volunteered. And, and like I say, Paget's is paradoxically more, more common in men, so. Really nice presentation. So I guess, given the, the nature of the meeting, we're here. So curve to implementation okay. of the results. I'm, I'm guessing this treatment is not hugely expensive. Um, so question, has this driven changes in guidelines? Okay. And, and are we now, Scottish Medicines Consortium, are we, are we doing this for our, for our patients? Good point. I mean, it's a bit early because we haven't even published the study yet, but I'm hoping Sorry. to get it into the annual somatic disease. But that's a very good question. And what we started on the back of this is we're doing a, a kind of patient preference or at least a participant preference. If you had a family history, would you get tested? And if you got tested, would you have a bone scan? And so that study is just about to start. And then if the patients, or at least think this is something I would have. Rory, that's what you said. <laughs> this is something I would have. Then I think it, it would be possible. I mean, the proportion with Paget's isn't that common. And the number of proportion with new lesions wasn't that high, 2%. But I was reflecting on this, and that is the same effect size that has led zoledronic acid to be introduced as an adjuvant treatment for breast cancer. So it's the same effect size. So I think it's a, it's a reasonable effect size and it would be good to see it um, you know, rolled out actually, but there's a bit of work to do. That's for my retirement perhaps. <laughs> Something to look forward to. So, so still not MHRA approved yet for it, this indication? It, it's not that? improved for prevention of Paget's disease, but of course it is approved for treatment of Paget's disease. And it turned out that um, actually a lot of the patients we treated actually had, you know, had Paget's disease in the end. But one might imagine you perhaps could put a pitch in for approval, but uh, but yeah, it's an inexpensive medicine and it, it could be so easily implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a really big thank you to all our speakers today. Um, four very different clinical studies. Um, please exchange expertise. I know a lot of you will be intrigued to interrogate the speakers about how they did their trials. But I think we should close the session by saying thank you to all the people who took part in these research studies because <coughs> none of us could do this work without you um, and the, the individuals who come forward to take part. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.